way through the book of Jonah. And so far we've seen that Jonah does things that we wouldn't expect a prophet of God to do. 
First of all, he, he, instead of going to the nation that he is instructed to go prophesy to, he turns and runs in the other direction. Prophets are usually bold men of God. He runs and hides. And when God sends a storm up on the boat that he is on, he's not the one struggling to, to try and figure out how to right this situation. It's all the pagan people. And when he reveals that he is a prophet of the one true God, they start to fear God, and when he says it's time to throw him overboard so that God will, will save the boat, they don't want to do it because they value his life. But when they decide to throw him off, they ask God for forgiveness, and then once they do and the sea is calm, they worship God. Jonah has not repented, he has not worshipped God, and he gets swallowed up by a fish. And then he prays to God, realizing that God has kept him alive for a reason, he prays and repents and then promises to fulfill his vow as a prophet and go to the city of Nineveh. And that's where we pick up the story today. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach the message that I tell you. So Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. Now Nineveh was an extremely large city, a three-day walk. Jonah set out on the first day of his walk in the city and proclaimed, In forty days Nineveh will be overthrown. The men of Nineveh believed in God. They proclaimed a fast and dressed in sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. When word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne. He took off his royal robe, put on sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he issued a decree in Nineveh. By order of the king and his nobles, no man or beast, herd or flock is to taste anything at all. They must not eat or drink water. Furthermore, both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth, and everyone must call out earnestly to God. Each must turn from his evil ways and from the violence he is doing. Who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. Then God saw their actions, that they had turned from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster he had threatened to do to them, and he did not do it. Finally, Jonah goes to the city of Nineveh. And it's a big city. It's going to take him three days to walk through the streets and share the message that God has with the city. The message is simple. Nineveh is going to be overthrown in 40 days. Now, Nineveh was a brutal nation. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, and they were the kind of people that would do despicable, brutal, ruthless things to the nations that they conquered. And they were enemies of Israel. They had conquered Israel and done really nasty things to them. So Jonah was likely afraid going into the city of Nineveh because of their reputation and because of the things that he may have even seen them do himself. But a funny thing happens. You would expect a warring nation like Nineveh to prepare for battle when they heard that an overthrow was coming in 40 days. But they don't do that. They start fasting, they put on sackcloth, and they cry out to God. Now, the fasting is just that they weren't eating. The, the sackcloth is a way for them to indicate their grieving and mourning over their sin. And then crying out to God is crying out to, to God for forgiveness. And then when the king decides that he is going to join in in this, he issues a decree that even the beasts, even the, the animals that live in the city limits should put on sackcloth and fast and cry out to God. Think about how crazy that sounds. You think about farmers trying to get sackcloth on their chickens and their pigs and their sheep and their cows and all their animals uh, to, to make sure that they are repenting as well. It's a crazy scene. It's a funny scene. But the reason for it is to indicate the totality of their repentance. They completely repented. They didn't repent just a little bit. Everybody from the king down to the lowliest animal repented and cried out to God. Now this is contrasted with the nation of Israel, where sometimes they cried out and repented, but only repented a little bit and still served other gods. They, they never had this full, complete repentance or maybe not very often, had a full, complete repentance. And the crazy thing is, is that they're crying out their repentance. It works. God forgives them. And this should surprise some people, because Nineveh was such a brutal nation. 
God forgave them. And that should at least give us one hope, and that is that if God can forgive such a brutal people, he can forgive you. He can forgive me. Maybe you have someone in your life who you will think will never turn to God. Keep praying for them and don't be afraid to share the message with them because they may repent and turn to God and he will forgive them. You might think that you've done something that is so horrible that God could never forgive you. If you cry out to him and repent, he will forgive you. Trust in Christ. His sacrifice is enough to cover all of your wrongdoings. So ask God for forgiveness. This passage also brings up a big question. If Jonah's going around preaching that Nineveh is going to be overthrown in 40 days and that it's not overthrown, does that mean that his prophecy failed? Does that mean that God actually changed his mind? Well, no, not necessarily. Um, most prophecy, when we think about it today, is the kind of prophecy where someone comes and predicts the future, right? It's one of those things where you, the people try and predict um, who's going to win an election or who's going to win a, the Stanley Cup or the NBA championship or the Super Bowl or the World Series or whatever it is. People try and predict these things. And if they get it right, sometimes we might think this person predicted it. They prophesied this. Well, that's not what biblical prophecy is about. Sometimes there's a little bit of that, but the vast majority of biblical prophecy is someone speaking for God, bringing a message, and generally it's a message saying, if you don't repent, bad things are going to happen. But if you do repent, I will relent. And what we have here is a classic case of that, that that they were called into repentance, so God wanted them to know what was going to happen if they didn't repent, to call them into repentance. So it's not that God changed his mind because he knew that they were going to repent, but the only way to repent is to be told that you need to repent. If you don't know that you need to repent, how are you ever going to repent, right? Which is why we shouldn't be afraid to share the message with those loved ones about, about who Jesus is and about how he forgives us because they don't know what they don't know. They don't know that they need to repent. To an Israelite reading this story for the first time, they might be upset at, at this. They might be upset that Jonah went to Nineveh. They might be upset that God forgave Nineveh. And remember what I said when we started this series. Think about how Jonah stands in for Israel, and think about how we're also like Jonah. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about how Israel and Jonah react to the repentance of Nineveh as we close out this story next week. All right, we'll see you then.